Uh, Charlie Edwards, I'm one of the um, Open Labs co-directors, the Open Lab at City Tech, which is a, a kind of OG Open Lab, and then um, uh, also a co-director of uh, CBOX Open Lab, Commons in a Box Open Lab, which is what we'll be focusing on today. Um, and why don't, why don't you pass it to someone else who should introduce themselves? So. Oh, yes. Um, so, Ed, um, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Ed Beck. I work over at SUNY. Um, I used to be able to introduce myself and be like, I have the youngest open lab in the group, but I, <laughs> I see Ruth is on the call. So we, that would be the newest open lab that I'm aware of. Awesome. Um, we've been using it to pilot using the open lab for about four years now, where we're putting that multi-site up against or in tandem to our kind of standard domain of one's own setup. So we run both of those concurrently here at Oneana. Awesome. I'll pass off to Jean. Yeah, th thanks, Ed. Um, my name is Jean Emerald. I'm the Open Knowledge Librarian at BMCC, Borough of Manhattan Community College, and I am representing um, our Open Lab team. Um, and I think we've are we've been going for about five or six years now. Um, we might be the first CUNY campus beyond City Tech that adopted. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, great. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So, um, how how do we want to kind of kick things off here? Uh, I know I know there's at least a little bit of a game plan so yes yeah so we thought that um, since we um, we don't want to assume people here or or elsewhere kind of um, um, know too much about CBOX Open Lab um, that um, uh, we want to give a little bit of an introduction first of all and so um, you know first of all I think we should so I think the game plan is like me like three minutes each me Ed and then Jean. So um, to talk a little bit, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview, and then um, Ed will talk about kind of how to contextualize it within the um, you know domains and other things that people use, and then Jean to talk about their experiences at BMCC, and then we have other people here who can you know jump in during the chat. Um, so yeah, so. Um, just to start off to say huge thanks um, to Reclaim for inviting us here. We're really grateful to be here. We're, um, this is very special for us. There are so many people, um, you know, whose work we admire, you know, um, uh, here or, um, you know, potentially might also see this, um, this uh, uh, recording. So we're, we're really looking forward to the conversation with you. We're really honored to be here. Um, so let me try to share, we've already established I'm a complete class of this, so this may go horribly wrong. Um, so I'm gonna, whoa. And I will say while uh, we're getting sharing going up here too, um, if uh, anyone who's in the call right now, so if, if you've got questions, um, there will be plenty of time for kind of open discussion stuff too, but you can also put things in the chat. Um, that's another good place for that kind of stuff. So. Please feel free to engage in whatever way it works for you. So um, are you seeing my screen? Yes. yes. Awesome. Thank God for that. OK. All right. So um, so yeah, this is the Open Lab at City Tech. Um, so City Tech is a public college of technology um, in downtown Brooklyn. It's part of the City University of New York system, CUNY system. Um, and back in 2010, um, the college won a grant from the US Department of Ed that enabled us to create the Open Lab as an open platform to support open education, collaboration, and community, particularly important at our commuter campus. It's built um, using WordPress multi site and BuddyPress, and everyone at the college can use it um, students, faculty, and staff. And it's really become an essential part of life at City Tech. So hundreds of courses use it each year, along with portfolios, student clubs, and all kinds of projects. And since it launched in um, fall 2011, um, it served over 45,000 members. Um, but we do want to really acknowledge that it wouldn't exist without the work of many other people, including Jim and you know everyone at UMW blogs and blogs at Baruch and everywhere you know the we rest on the work of many other people so um, what we're showing here is um, the CUNY Academic Commons so it's one of many that CUNY has a really strong track record in building open source software especially um, uh, 
WordPress related. And um, so this was created in 2009 by Matt Gold and others at the Grad Center as a space to connect members of the 25 campus CUNY community. And it inspired the creation of the Open Lab as a space, um, um, you know, just for city tech. So the Commons is for the whole community and, and people at, at the at city tech really wanted a space of their own. So um, the Commons team went on to create um, Commons in a box um, to help other people um, create uh, commonses of their own. And it's used by groups and organizations around the world so when people started coming to us at the open lab at city tech and asking how they could launch their own open labs we um, naturally we collaborated with them to create a new version of um, cbox um, for uh, to modeled on the open lab at city tech also specifically focused on teaching learning and collaboration and so, yeah, the result is Cbox Open Lab. This is our community hub space hosted by Reclaim, we'll say. Um, so this is an example um, Commons in a Box installation, and it's also where people kind of gather and communicate about the project. We have a small but growing and very enthusiastic community. So you can see here what it looks like. It looks very similar to the Open Lab at City Tech. And you can customize it for the needs of your community, whether that's um, big or small. And um, so you have, have courses, projects, communities, portfolios. You don't need to have all or indeed you know, any of those. You can change that up. And then within the installation, members are able to customize their own um, uh, areas for uh, working themselves. So with um, profiles and sites and all of that good stuff and also um you know different privacy settings and everything so but i won't get into all of that i will just stop now and hand off to ed awesome thanks charlie so um where i'm going to be coming from my perspective here is going to be coming as a domain of one's own admin and having already had kind of the full kind of reclaim treatment, being able to give uh, students access to sites, being able to use a wide variety of tools, but it seemed like everybody just went straight to WordPress anyway, I was looking for a option to stand alongside our larger domains project, but really focused on a way to get my students up and started really, really quickly. So when I started to look at what Open Lab does compared to my larger domain of one's own. Um, what I, my three minute share that I've got, I'm I'm thinking about this from the mindset of here are five things that the Open Lab does that are difficult to do on that standard domain of one's own setup. So one of the things that I like about the Open Lab is as soon as you log in, you can see I have pretty much the same look and view as the City Tech and other Open Labs that you've seen. I've got a landing page, and that is filled with exemplars and courses, courses, portfolios, projects. And that's something that's really hard to do on a domain of one's own, to be able to say, like, here are all the projects that encompass my domain of one's own. And what I really like about this is if I were to drill into any one of these, um, the different project owners can decide do I want to be visible on that homepage or do I not? It's not something that I'm like constantly reaching out to people. Hey, submit into my showcase site. Come and check out here. It's something that they can choose to share. And if later on, after they've already shared, they'd like to pull it back, that's something that they can do. Over at the top here, I can go and say like, hey, could I search through the portfolios? And I have a list of all of the portfolios that are public. Not every portfolio on the Open Lab is going to be listed on this site. It's the student's choice of whether that's going to be shown or not. And that's really important to me. You know, so that that's one thing that's really important. And I think that's one of the key characteristics of why like Open Lab might be the solution for you compared to a, a generic, more vanilla WordPress multi-site. Number two, I said that not every site is here. 
And that's important as well. It's important for me that on the open lab, if a, if a faculty member came to me and said, I want to do portfolios for every single one of my students on the open lab, students can control the permissions of their website so that they could have a website that only they and their instructor can see, or they and the people they invite can see. It lets me kind of walk that line with FERPA where I can have them use the exact same infrastructure as everyone else, but choose to remain private on a kind of a local network inside of my open lab. So right now I'm not logged in. So when I look over here, I'm only seeing the 200 portfolios that they've chosen to share it publicly. Now, even in here, there's some, di there's some difference because, you know, if you look at the two at the top here, this person has made their site completely open. I can visit the site. This person, I can tell that there's a site and I can ask for an invitation to see their site, but I have not been granted access yet. So they have those multiple permission levels that they can navigate under like, is this going to be a public? Is this going to be private? Or is this going to be completely hidden? I don't want any trace of this on the internet. So that's my number two thing. My number three thing is templates. We talk all the time in Domain of One's Own. How do I help people get started really quickly? Is there some starter content or some filler content that I could give them that would help them hit the ground running? Now, when I joined the Open Lab project, there was one template for each one of these types. And this, is, this was cool because I could say like, okay, here's your portfolio template. Here's your course template. But then a really cool thing happened. BMCC said, we would like this to be more flexible. We want to have multiple templates and we want to have a chooser. When you say launch a portfolio, we want to be able to say like, oh, here's a visual artistic portfolio. Here is a more word-based portfolio and have multiple templates that the individual user can control from. And this is kind of like part of how Open Lab works. So they work as a team is different new things are going to come to the commons, to the public one, the one that I'm on, are kind of piloted at the different open labs. They might be coming from the city techs installation. They might be coming from the BMCC's installation. And they're saying, okay, is this feature ready to be put into the fully open open lab? So I really like that. Um, so templates, the other thing that I really like, and I'm just gonna um, go to a individual site on here. So this is a site that's being built um, at Oneonta. I really like the branding of a universal header and the universal footer. Now, I know this could be done on any uh, WordPress multi-site, but the, the, that it's built into the open lab is really cool for me. And I always worry about things like, do I have an accessibility statement that is able to be found on all the child product? projects? Do I have a, you know, my takedown notice on all of the child? Do I have that contextual information about how this was built and what SUNY Oneana's, you know, connection is it? So I really like that universal footer and it can help me, you know, share this information about the open lab to anyone who visits any one of the child sites that make, you know, part of SUNY Oneana's little network. And uh, number five, that I think I like about the open lab is I really like the way individuals don't own websites, but groups own websites. So it's using BuddyPress and BuddyPress groups in order to be the quote unquote owner of the website, which means it is much easier on the open lab to invite new people to collaborate and give them the same permissions as everyone else. And even though I created this Faculty Center web page, now all four of us are equal admins. And if I won the lottery tomorrow and quit my job, they can remove my permissions and those next three can move on with there. I know that's possible with domain of one's own, but it's kind of like we have to like an admin has to come in and make that transfer. This individuals who've been trained can do that type of succession planning and movement. And I think that that's not so easy to do in a domain of one's own, but it's something that it's easy to do in the open lab. And so that's my, you know, kind of share was just thinking of that perspective of domain of one's own versus the open lab. Um, and, and 
that's not against each other versus, but domain of one's own and the open lab, let's say, I like that better, um, how these things complement each other. Awesome, thanks so much, Ed. Um, let's see if I can get um, mine up. Mm. I'll just say while um, while uh, um, Jean is is doing this, we did not pay Ed to say any of that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ed. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, are folks seeing my screen? I'm not used to this yes. platform. God, awesome. Thanks so much. Um, again, my name is uh, Jean Amaral, and I'm the Open Knowledge Librarian at. Um, Borough of Manhattan Community College, part of the CUNY system, one of our, I think, seven community colleges. Um, and I'm representing a team um, that is led by Chris Stein, the chair of our Media Arts and Technology Department. Chris is the person who got the grant that got us the Open Lab to start. Um, since then, we've also been using some of our um, open education funding from the New York State Department of Education to do different projects um, through the Open Lab as well. Um, and so our team uh, consists of four of us that. Um, have full-time jobs doing other things, but contribute to um, sort of keeping the Open Lab going. And that's our open, myself as the Open Knowledge Librarian, our CEDLs, our Center for Excellence Teaching, Learning, and Scholarship Director, um, and our digital learning. And then we have a couple of part-timers who help us do student outreach and work with faculty designing sites. Um, so this looks very similar to what you've already seen um, in terms of the layout. I did want to point out a couple of things that we're doing um, at least one the way that you can um, uh, customize um, based on your needs for your particular institution. Um, we came at the Open Lab as our virtual campus. That's how we talk about it. Um, this is the sp anything that we can do on our physical campus, we hope to be able to do um, in this physical campus as well. And so if you look at that menu up the top, you can see courses. So we have faculty teaching on the Open Lab. Um, you see portfolios, we left education and whatever else we were using and are now doing our portfolios here. Um, there's also communities. Um, and I think other, um, out of the box, it may come with clubs, um, but we renamed ours to communities and then clubs is a subset of those communities um, because we knew that we would have more than students wanting to gather together um, around shared um, passions. And so to have that community, um, category for folks uh, to think think big in terms of who they want to join with and um, and do things with. And then we have the projects here as well. Um, and so just to give you a couple of examples of what these look like, um, we do um, a lot of what powers our work here is our open education, open knowledge work. Um, so we have faculty who are teaching in the open. Um, and this is a course um, which is English 100. Um, it can be designed very much like an LMS. You'll notice on the side there are weekly pages um, or week, yeah, weekly pages which talk about what they're doing each week. So um, just a nicer version, easy, more easily accessible. This is open um, to the world. And so as Ed mentioned, the privacy settings are really important. So a faculty member can just have their students in their course or they can open it just to BMCC or they can open it to the world if they want to teach completely in the open. So we do have our faculty teaching here. Um, sometimes they don't do their whole course, but they might do um, assignments. Um, so they would like students, this is our open pedagogy program where we um, encourage faculty to design assignments that are what we call renewable, not disposable, where they're actually sharing them with others besides just the instructor. And so here um, we have um, an instructor who has her students go through an exercise of creating a where I'm from poem where she has a template that they fill in. Um, and also where I'm going and then audio video versions of these. Um, so uh, drawing on really strong pedagogical emphasis around universal design for learning and things like that and asset pedagogies to tap into um, our students' strengths and skills. Um, we also do faculty development here. Um, so this is an example of our open education seminars where um, when we work with faculty, they come here for the schedule, they share conversations with each other and um, resources as well. So again, anything that we would do on campus, we're doing in this virtual space. Um, and uh, this is an example, um, not just of open work, um, but research. Um, so 
uh, this is a research site. This is a faculty member um, who has a research project. Um, and this is where they share um, with their funder, IMLS, and others the work that's going on. Um, and the last one is our Office of Research. Just wanted to show the students actually um, create posters. This is an event happening today. Uh, so to show that it's beyond the classroom um, with different offices um, and different organizations and groups. Um, and the last one um, did want to show, show, oh, we also do publications. Um, so this is the Inquirer, which is um, a faculty publication that's published, I think, um, either once or twice a year. So the articles are available. Um, again, to anybody in the world. So the, it, the, just the flexibility in terms of the things that you can do here from publications. We've also had folks put up um, conferences um, on the Open Lab. Our staff did that. Um, so from teaching to communities gathering to share information and get together from publications um, and more. Uh, and did just want to show this community clubs. Um, so you can see, I think, oops, slowing down a little bit. Um, we do have clubs. Um, for students, uh, so these are the student ones. Um, and then when you click on communities, you can see the wider communities beyond the clubs um, where uh, we have different organizations and different groups coming together, including our student newspaper, um, which is here under the Black Panther News. And I will stop it there, I think. So this is the time we envisioned you all had like great questions for us, <laughs> but I've also got six questions in my back pocket that we can ask. <laughs> and maybe I'll ask question number one uh, while we wait for a couple other people to, to throw them into the chat. Um, the first question on our list was, when a faculty comes to you, what makes a great project for the open lab? Like what kind of projects do you see and be like, mm, this needs to go on open lab? Charlie, why don't you go first? I uh, I'm, me I'm <laughs> meeting myself. Yes. yes. Um, so I mean, I think that um, you know we, uh, as as uh, Jean was talking about, we very much view it as a community space. So it's kind of used for an enormous range of things. Um, but if I had to, so, I mean, we've got just kind of community and belonging initiatives. We've got advisement, internships, faculty support, um, professional development, course coordination. Um, but like if, if I, you know, wanted to just highlight one, one thing out of all of these equally important things, um, there's uh, the OER um, program, which Kayleen is, is here. And uh, we've just had such a deep collaboration with, um, with the OER program, and um, which has been super important in, um, you know, not just kind of hosting stuff for them, but also building features together with them. So this is, you know, the thing about community built software is, you know, you have that really deep collaboration and some um, really core ideas around the open lab around, um, uh, we have something called shared cloning, um, which is, you know, um, all of these things and the attribution that goes along with that. A lot of that was just really developed in collaboration with um, the OER program. So, Kayleen, I don't know if you want to jump in and, and say anything about um, OER. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I don't know. I you might, are also muted. I might, oh, and it gets dark when I start talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, I might approach, like, this topic maybe a little bit differently, which is that, like, um, definitely um, think what Charlie mentioned is so um, crucial and, and really how things how this collaboration worked out, but in terms of just like this platform and what it does in, with my own approach as like, I'm the open education librarian at City Tech. And I think the affordance of it brings like so much to like an ethic that embraces like transparency. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to correlate obviously to being fully open and fully public. I don't mean it really in that way, but it's just like really being able to document and evidence like the intention and the work uh, and the product that comes out of it. That's been really important to me in my own work. 
um, but also my collaboration with um, Charlie, Bree, and all the folks in the Open Lab team. And I think it connects very well to valuing the teaching and learning work that faculty do with the OER programming and just more, you know, their commitment with teaching. And I think that the Open Lab and CBOX OL is is so helpful to that whole kind of ethic and, and process and um, really valuable for, for us at City Tech. I, I'll jump and uh, Jim has um, mentioned something in the chat and I do need to go to my next meeting. So um, I'll just quickly address that. And then there is a clonable question in the chat that y'all can take up <laughs> after sure. I go. Yeah, so I about take. the, yeah, the vision of OER um, helping fuel and fund the platform like VMCCs. Um, so I, um, I'm going to say it's open education, open knowledge, right? Because OER, a lot of people think about the actual OER materials, that, that limited thing. So we have a very expansive vision at BMCC for open education, open knowledge. Um, and we see the open lab as the space where we get to share um, the open knowledge work um, that our community does um, with the world. Um, and we do have a heavy emphasis um, on creating open educational resources, but also open pedagogy. Um, so providing that space on the open lab where our students' voices, which we believe are so important, can get out there and be shared with other communities when they choose to do so, right? So choice is always an important part of this. Um, and that's why the privacy settings are so um, valuable on the open lab. So for example, we have um, programs where we have students doing public writing. So BMCC Reads is one of our communities where students, we actually pay federal work study students to create um, book reviews and post them on the open lab under that BMCC Reads community. We have students creating podcasts um, and faculty creating podcasts as part of our open pedagogy program. So a lot of these things we initially seed with funding from the New York State Department of Education funds that both CUNY and SUNY receive um, with small stipends to give some encouragement to begin these projects. Um, but we couldn't do this without the open lab, bringing it all together that there's that one community, that virtual campus where folks can go find the things that our faculty and our students are doing through the podcasting, through the public writing in various ways, um, through the open teaching, teaching um, completely openly, sharing student work through those courses and things like that. Um, so we've been really privileged and um, uh, very uh, thankful that we have had the NYSED funding um, for a while now that allows us to put not money not into just the faculty and students, but also into the development. So CBOX Open Lab. So we help fund some of the development um, that goes into CBOX Open Lab that needs to happen in the back as we think of new things that um, we need. Um, so yeah, I hope that addresses the interest in that. It does. And it, also the, the whole point you made about, you know, community driven content as a kind of an element of OER that I think often gets forgotten. And when you have this space as a virtual campus where people are doing things and then are accessible beyond that, um, it's a beautiful kind of way of kind of understand the ethic of open well beyond the kind of OER is textbook, but virtual. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I like how the platform itself as an open platform kind of reinforces that. To your point, Kayleen, as well as the ethics that go be into, into it and the transparency as well. So, no, it's very cool. Thank you. Sure. Um, lovely to see everybody. I need to run. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Jean. My answer to the that question is going to be different than everybody else's, partly because of that nature of running a domain of one's own alongside the open lab, right? So, for me, one of the first, you know, things for to decide if this is going to be a good open lab project has got to be is it good for WordPress, right? So if, if WordPress seems like the tool to use there, that's the first indication that it might be an open lab project because I have other options at my disposal. I can go to Omeka, I can go to Pressbooks where a lot of my OER and course materials actually end up on Pressbooks, not open lab. So if it's WordPress is the good solution for me. And then like thinking about like the, the customizations that these people are gonna wanna do to the site, is it going to work with the plugins that I've installed on the Open Lab? Because one of my goals is to keep the number of plugins on the Open Lab pretty low. It's not zero. I have things like Gravity Forms installed on there. I have things like Gravity Forms Advanced Post Creator. I've got things like Taxopress, so we can go do custom taxonomies right in there. So I'm not like going like WordPress only, you know, bare bones. But I've chosen a list of plugins that I'm willing to put on the open lab. And if it looks like they're going to need other ones than the ones I've picked, 
I might go the full domain of one's own route and set them up in cPanel all by themselves. If it's just going to need, I just need a couple things, I go this route. And I try to get as much as I can on the open lab first. And it's the exceptions that are going to go into more of a domain of one's own. So I'm kind of using it as, as a, not a catch-all, but like, what are the projects that really fit in here? Um, and that's just part of this mentality of like running these two projects next to each other. Um, uh, Jim, I, I will, we'll get, I see you got your hand raised. We'll get in one second, but I want to, uh, um, ask, uh, Chris's question about clonable sites just because it was asked a little while ago. Um, yeah. and <clears throat> just for the recording too, the, the chat doesn't show up in the recording. So the question was, can we, can someone speak about the clonable tag and how reusing sites works? It's a thoughtful feature and one that he's jealous of. And yeah, it, it is one of my favorite features at Open Lab too, I'll say. So um, maybe I'll say something and then if Jenna and uh, Brie or anybody wants to jump jump in. But like, um, so that cloning actually came out, initially started as kind of an instrumental thing. Like when we first launched, um, we noticed to our horror that like when we when we rolled over from the one semester to the next, that um, faculty kind of conditioned by Blackboard or whatever, some faculty, were deleting student work to reuse their course sites. And we were like, ah! <laughs> so in short order, we kind of developed the ability to clone things. But then um, we came up with the idea of shared cloning. And I think it's kind of one of the most um, open labby things <laughs> that really goes to the heart of what the open lab is which is that you know how generous people are with their time especially at a um a hugely underfunded uh commuter campus um you know with a very large adjunct population and where faculty have a huge admin loads but it's the ability to say on your course or project or club actually anything you can check a little box and say um you know take my stuff, reuse it, do whatever you want with it. And um, we've used that, that, so that kind of came in quite a long time ago now, and we've used it as a basis of um, other things like um, model courses that we uh, create now where that's kind of more intentional thing. So rather than just, um, so shared cloning, people can just say, hey, yeah, take my stuff. Um, model courses is, please take my stuff and use it, feel free to use it. And um, that sometimes clarifies, you know, issues where people are hesitant to take other people's stuff. You know, they're like, oh, really, can I? I don't know if I can. But the thing about it is that it builds in attribution to the original creator. Um, so you can actually, and you can, so you can see, you know, the chain backwards and you can also see the chain forwards from your work you know, how it ended up being used across the open app. So, you know, we think that's it's a pretty kind of powerful feature that we love. And uh, I don't know, Jenna or Brie, if anybody else wants to, or Kayleen, if you want to jump in and say anything else about it. I'll just say a so, quick something about, um, Charlie mentioned model courses, but um, we've also used it um, for if you're doing course coordination, so you want sort of a consistency across all sections. Um, I'm a course coordinator for many courses and it's really helpful because we'll often get faculty, especially this happens at CUNY, it was certainly at City Tech who are, uh, you know, your class starts tomorrow. Can you get, you know, can you, can you jump in and start teaching? Um, because it's a last minute situation. So it's very easy to just be like, here, take my class. And they they can be you know have an entire course laid out for them, which of course they can go and change and modify. But it certainly helps. It certainly helps with that trial by fire that happens when you have new faculty or faculty teaching a class for the first time. Um, and I just also say that um, it, the the simplicity of it. So if you've if you've used WordPress before, it's fairly easy. And I noticed that Ed, you said something about um, uh, posts. Um, I, I do almost all of my the structure of my site with agendas, uh, you know, weekly agendas, and those are cloned. Those can easily be cloned and modified. So I might not have understood your your message there, but so whether you're working in pages or posts, um, you can clone that whole site and be ready to go and 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 start teaching. Um, it's also useful for you know if you have if you've structured. We've done some things where we've structured a um, sort of. Uh, 
uh, faculty support um, uh, website. So other, so one department may have used it and then, oh, okay, I, I like the way that's structured and they'll clone that. Um, and obviously the content's gonna be completely different, but they might wanna use the structure of it. So those are some thoughts. Awesome. Uh, Jim Luke, you get your hand raised. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so I've got actually one big question that probably is better split into two. Um, but first of all, I just want to say y'all are just my heroes. I have, I have wanted for literally over a decade to do some stuff. Well, originally it was, I looked at buddy press with drool. And then it was like, oh, wait a minute. There's this commons in a box. And then when open lab, but unfortunately I you know, really have not had the resources or, or the opportunity to actually implement it despite what I'm dreaming. And that actually kind of gets to my question. So my question has to do with, um, and for anybody that wants to chime in, from your experience, in getting started with one of these things and then operating it, um, it's based off of a BuddyPress multi-site install, right? So at, and this is where the question kind of splits. The problem I always had with BuddyPress or similar comments in a box is I didn't have anybody to play with. How do you start up an experiment when it's just you, I mean, you know, you know, and I, I actually toyed with the idea of I would run one class in you know in it, and boy, does that you know I was thinking that would really look stupid, you know. So, what is kind of like the minimum viable um, collection of people or things, faculty or students or courses or whatever, to be able to at least get a minimal running example because closely related to that is I don't know what you have found um, this kind of stuff at LCC uh, and other community colleges here in the Midwest is very much a uh, it's got to be bottoms up and in order to get any support so you kind of have to go off the reservation and experiment and you're never going to get the support until the folks at the top can actually envision it. And they can't envision it until it's operated. So, you know, you can see that challenge on the lower end. At the other end of my question, and you may want to split your answer is, at what point would you say this is, you're pushing this too far, you need to split this in terms of installation? Uh, you know, where you're, you're, you know, at what point are you saying, I'm really, you know, I'm operationally as an admin, I'm trying to run WordPress.com here <laughs> instead of running a decent sized practical multi-site running, uh, you know, with Reclaim's help. Does that make any, uh, particularly because at the upper side, I'm imagining some use cases where we might involve faculty instead of oh all the participants the courses and the students are within one college it might be imagine oh we, they're all in physical sciences at three different institutions uh, in the state so uh, have that what's what's the bare minimum to get going and at what point do I need to think no don't no dream past that because it's too big so if it's okay i'll answer the first part of your question and i'll tell the origin story of the geneseo open lab okay okay so i don't work at geneseo at that time my closest collaborator in suny who now get got stolen by reclaim and i'm still bitter about it um amanda <laughs> Schmidt was working at geneseo and she's like okay i have this project and there's one center that wants a website and they also want to have student portfolios so they want like the center to have a site and they want the individual students to have connected portfolios to that site where they can talk about their individualized majors. 
And so, you know, when we when we she started talking about that, I my first impression was we should build a uh, WordPress multi-site for it. Um, then I got crazy and I was like, hey, I read about last week this thing called CBox Open Lab. What if we built this in Open Lab instead of um, instead of building it as an individual WordPress multi-site. And so we mocked it up and, 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 and we, we, we built that and we could have built it as just the center site still at that point. Like the center site would be the hub with all the spokes would be the individual students portfolios. But we were like, well, we're doing all of this work to set up this multi-site. What if somebody else wants a portfolio that's not connected to that, you know, that central centers hub? And so that minimum vile product for us was there was an organization and there was not a ton of portfolio, 10 portfolios that needed to be built. And that's what we built the first Open Lab in SUNY with. And that was a learning process um, for us. We were doing it trial and error, just the two of us. Um, and then Oneonta's open lab is one week younger than Geneseo's open lab. Uh, because I was like, man, this seems pretty good. Um, once we set the Geneseo uh, open lab up, why don't I set up a similar one? And it was the early decision that we made was, wow, it seems like all of the effort that I'm putting into standing up the open lab would benefit other projects so that they don't have to recreate that wheel in order to get started. And so the the first ones that we built were not not huge. Now I think my site has 650 sub sites on it now, which okay. still I think makes me the smallest compared to everybody else who's in the room who has teenage open labs. Um, so I'll I'll pass the when is it too big to somebody else because that's clearly not me yet. Oh, great! That's helpful. Thanks, Ed. So, I mean, just to say from the um, CBOX Open Lab, Matt Gold is here as well, so I can probably also talk to, you know, similar, con like conceptually, it's obviously not CBOX Open Lab, but um, things around uh, managing large installations. But, um, you know, the, the Open Lab at this point, we've it's served like over 45,000 members and we have many, many thousands of sites. Um, so behind the scenes, we're very lucky. We have the wonderful... Um, Boone Gorgas and uh, Raymond Ho as well, um, working with CBOX Open Lab. But um, so uh, Boone um, works with us on the Open Lab as as well. And I think I think we he did make some interventions. A lot again, technology has changed so much. So I don't know if this would really be necessary now or how this would work. But he did uh, uh, sharded our database a long time ago. Um, but you know that again, that was a very long time ago, and that that you know I'm sure there there are all kinds of different solutions now. Um, we're running on a we're kind of a little old school. We're running on a dedicated server, um, not um, WooCommerce, but, um, but yeah. So um, so that's for the original Open Lab. So it certainly has been able to scale. The model has successfully scaled. Um, it's matter. It's more really a matter of um, you know your capacity obviously we're not su supporting 45,000 members all at once and then most of those are not active they're alumni um so you know it's more in you know the seven or eight thousand um a year rather than um than those kinds of numbers so I think it's gonna it's your constraints are going to be more around like helping people your bandwidth to help people use and support people using the platform I think I don't know, Matt, if you have things you want to say. Yes, he's got Yeah, I, I, thank you. I mean, first of all, I think it's a great and question because um, because that that chicken or egg thing about like how 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 can you get it started and how can you get admin buy in if you don't have anything already going is is really tough. Um, I will say I have seen. Um, I think Paul Schacht at, at Geneseo was you know had um, uh, you know C box installations going with like just a project or a center or a class. And I do think you can start that small. I think the key thing is to try and get some momentum behind it. Um, 
for smaller inst institutions or, or spaces where you don't really have uh, comrades like sort of running with you, I think trying to build even kind of regional alliances, you know, can be one way to go. But I also think, you know, this is the the beauty of the reclaim involvement here is that it it means that you don't, one key thing is that with reclaim, you don't have to have the technical, you know, expertise fully at your university. You you can sort of rely on reclaim to get going and then just work on building the, the kind of pedagogical um, alliances and communities around the installation. So I, I I think it is kind of feasible to start smaller with one class, one one excited faculty member, one excited and uh, educational technologist. Um, but then obviously you're, you know, Jim, as I think your question points to, like you have to start building momentum around that and and building towards something you can show to people and getting getting more people involved. Well, Reclaim does love you, Matt Gold. And I do want to say. One of the things that's interesting to the point I think you were making as well, Charlie, is, you know, even on the open lab with the sharded DBs and Christopher, I know you will feel the pain of <laughs> of that. You know, I mean, I, I might there might be an anxiety attack as I say sharded. You don't but, use the S word here, okay? Exactly. <laughs> but with that infrastructure, what we're finding generally as we continue to run bigger WordPress sites like BMCC, and I don't want to jinx myself, and I hope Chris B is not one of our sysadmins who said, I can't believe you just said that, Jim. But that's a big um, open lab, and it runs pretty cleanly. And I think the infrastructure right now with containers and with scalable infrastructure a lot, allows a lot of that to happen pretty seamlessly. It's the idea of, Jim, how do you get that community and sustain it? And I think the um, community can scale pretty cleanly and the technology, whereas we're not sharding DBs, we're not doing what we had to do in 2010 or 11 to manage growth like we did. Um, and that's a nice thing. Um, I do think it makes it easier. You can focus on growing the community and I think the scale will come pretty seamlessly with the technology. Plus, well, that it's come a long way, right? Right, Taylor? Yeah, well, and I was going to just say that, like, that's that's the thing you want to put your effort into, scaling the community, building, working with faculty, working with students. That's really hard work that you need to make room for. Um, otherwise, I, I, I don't think these things are often successful just on their own, right? Yeah. I think you need some someone or some team pushing that at the onset, especially. Yeah, Reclaim Press didn't exist when I started my open lab. And I know I gave Jim anxiety because my open lab was running on shared hosting. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. <laughs> my, my, my open lab was running on shared hosting until we got to about 400 sites. And we were like, man, we need to get this thing off of shared hosting. And, you know... We paid for it. We paid Taylor to do the transfer. But what was nice is at a lot of levels, it's just a WordPress multi-site. And Reclaim really knows WordPress multi-sites. And they just transferred it. I'm now on um I'm now on the cloud infrastructure. Again, I did about a year before they launched Reclaim Press. Um, so I ended up on Reclaim Cloud instead, which they're basically the same thing, minus the the nice graphic interface on the uh reclaim press but, you know i you know it, it just worked and so reclaim was a good fit for me because as my open lab grew i knew that they had multiple options that could grow with me and reclaim also does not pay me to say that <laughs> <laughs> well and it's I, that i kind of mentioned it before but i will just say like the functionality built on top of wordpress that is open lab is kind of amazing to me because, I mean, we, we all know WordPress is very flexible, but I, I've worked with plenty of WordPress plugins that are pains in the neck, you know, a real pain. And, but Open Lab does so much with, I, I'm not gonna say so little, cause it's a ton of effort and, but I should say it does so much while keeping like the technical stuff pretty seamless for people, I think. Yeah. And it's like a deployment. 
it's not like one plugin. It's like a it's many series of plugins, but it and, works well, yeah. and it's also pretty easy to install, right? Like it's literally yeah. just you fire up a WordPress multi-site and you install the CBox plugin and you hit go, and but it will walk. You I through. have a sixth thing that OpenLab does well that Taylor just hit on that I want to like <laughs> expand on a little bit. But it's true. I mean, Ed, before you do, one of the things I think that was already brought up here is the core investment in people to make sure that works, right? We talked about Boone um, and Ray and some of that stuff. And like CUNY has led the way in this, right? The fact that so many schools are using this technology and finding ways to get it funded. And then on top of that, you know, figuring out like other schools using it across the country, but like, how do you make that sustainable and part of, you know, the same ticket item that people will pay a million or two million or three million dollars for the LMS or for some other system. And I think I love CUNY in the way that it has done this historically now for 15, 16 years. And um, it's now a part of the fabric of um, this broad city campus. And how do you make that understood and fundable is a really, really big question. So I'm sorry to say, cut you off, Ed, but like that, it's there are two people who are working on it, but there's also a community and a fabric that needs to find funding and make this sustainable and do it for the long run. And that's something I, I, I'd love to hear more about too, because it's unique. You know, so many people just get like people who deal with contracts and vendors, they don't do anything internally anymore. And CUNY is not running down that road, which I love. Yeah. So, what I was going to say is, that there's maybe 15 plugins. Charlie, does that sound about right? Maybe 15 plugins that make up the Open Lab package that are installed by Open Lab. And one of the things that I love is I s install the one kind of uh, CBox Open Lab plugin, and then it manages the upgrades of all of those helper plugins that make it work so that those are kind of invisible to me. And what's really important is those 15 different plugins that make up CBox Open Lab each have their own different upgrade cycles. But what Open Lab does is it kind of freezes all of those versions at one that they know works for me so that I can just do my upgrades along with the academic calendar. So twice a year, I know there's going to be an upgrade to CBox Open Lab and that they're going to, at that time, tell me, ah, use BuddyPress this version. Ah, use this version of, uh, of BB Forums. Use this version of all these other plugins, whether they're making them custom or whether they're just modifying them and sending, setting logical defaults on them like they do with their internal messaging app. Right. Like so that the, that's really important to me is that they are doing the work to test, make sure it works and then freeze it, the versions that I know are good. That way I'm not dealing with a, oh, I upgraded BB forums in the middle of the semester and it broke everything kind of deal. Um, I was, I was just that gave me an idea. Um for both Ed and Jim, kind of a service here. If, I mean, blah, blah, blah. what something the larger community needs, I think, to expand usage is easier ways to share bits and pieces of knowledge. And what I was thinking is Jim, you know, and Taylor and Reclaim's doing just wonderful job, and especially last few years, expanding the training and the education and what's available in terms of support. Um, but simple things that, you know, to have like, Ed, you mentioned you got, you pretty much keep a list of 15 plugins that you try to limit. No, what I meant was there's 15 plugins that Open Lab uses that make Open Lab work. Okay. That, you know, so I heard that, oh man, that would be great if there were just a list. Wouldn't even have to explain. But, you know, where a list and yeah, maybe hosted somewhere, you know, Reclaim could host the list and just where I could go, oh, that's what they use in terms of plugins. And, you know, that would jumpstart so much stuff. Um, I don't know. But 
I'm really famous for making work for other people. So, I <laughs> in fact, Jim, I think that's what Seabox does. And we can have you up and running on a brand new spanking new blog with no, I'm kidding. But yeah, I think it's that's exactly what it does. Well, yeah. maybe you want need one for us or something, you know, for all the customers. That's why you're here. Could be something. <laughs> and I know um <clears throat> there's I, hey, I Jim, believe, I just pop what you asked for into the chat. I believe there yeah, I was gonna say I know that there's a page on the Commons in the Box website of what the core the core plugins, which are the required plugins for it are. Um, but, you know, and there are also like, um, like, like uh, Tom did some experimenting with us on a plugin that people could install in WordPress to make a little short code that said, these are the plugins that are installed on my WordPress site you're looking at, which that could be an interesting solution. I think, um, I think that the solution is, just like almost anything, I suppose, less technical than it is building that idea and in, in other people and saying, we should all do this, you know? Um, but I, yeah, I, I would agree though, that the more people can share that stuff, the more, um, I, the more it helps other folks. So. I'd love to hear from the folks working with um, Open Lab Cbox. Are you leveraging now with the kind of, you know, diaspora of social sites as things kind of exploded? That hey, this is not our only our virtual campus, as I heard brought up, but like this is a safe space, and this is a space where a lot of your your data will not be mined, and you will kind of you know have this. And how are you working with that? Because the idea, I guess, of BuddyPress was always that it was a WordPress-based social network, and so is it is it feeding or filling that gap for you all? Does someone want to jump in on that? We've got Jody was able to join us at uh, half time here, so I don't know if, if Jody, if you have any thoughts about that or I don't have uh, the most encouraging things to say about that. I can always blather on about. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, I I feel like um, a lot of things that oh, I think you might be muted. No, I'm not. No, actually, muted. Charlie, we can hear her. Yeah. When I'm on your end. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, good. That's very um. But maybe you don't want to hear what I have to say. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling the um, there. I do feel like there's a difference in how people are using Open Lab post pandemic. That um, I don't think is necessarily different from how they are existing on campus either. But there's just like a lack. There's less um, community building among students. I feel like there's a greater sense of alienation. So anything we can do to um, to use that to make it feel like it's a a community space. Um, when it happens, it's really wonderful, but but I, I don't think it's happening in the same way that it was, say, pre-2020. Um, I don't know if my colleagues are feeling that same, that same feeling, um, but I feel like when we work with a specific group, like we've just um, finished up working with six Open Lab interns, and I feel like that really did give them a space, and they really did feel like they started to, to see it and take ownership, um, which was really wonderful to see. But again, they were like, you know, guided by um, the shared interest in the work that they were doing for their internship. Um, I keep trying for opportunities for my class to do that. But again, there's like the energy is just completely different than, than pre-pandemic. Someone say something more positive. I don't, that's not my that's not my uh, usual mo for. I have something things. that's not also not as positive. Um, I don't want to make promises um, based on WordPress, not data mining. Um, when there are concerns about automatic, I do have Jetpack installed on my Open Lab. I may reconsider that in the future. Um, automatic. You know, understanding that WordPress.com and WordPress.org are different entities, but that that gets very blurry with that Jetpack plugin that installs a lot of the features from WordPress.com, you know, that they were sharing data for uh, building uh, AI, that they may have shared data that should have been kept private because people had set their privacy settings that weren't there. Um, you know, I don't want to make those promises 
if I don't know enough that I know that it's both true and will remain true for the next year. Because I, I don't know that. I kind of I think this also ties into what Jim was saying kind of about the, you know, the implosion of social media, this idea that if we are the ones controlling our own data, then we get to say when it's shared, which is one thing, again, I keep coming back to this cloning thing because <laughs> that's the feature that I really, really love. Um, and that it it's a sharing in a way that is conscious and you're including uh, all the CC notices. And it's just, I, I think that trying to build that into part of the culture of an open lab is, is brilliant. And, um, and I think could also, again, we we're trying to get as much, uh, jetpack off of our network as possible. We've been pretty good at it um, as well as getting Google off of it and moving away from Google, Google analytics, but, um, having, having these tools where students and faculty and your, your, your whole community really can control their own um, connections and their own data and all of that as I think one of the things that Open Lab and WordPress really brings to, to education. Yeah, I, I think if we want to end on a more positive note, after the two downers have, you know, <laughs> spoken, or I'll just speak for myself that I'm the downer who has spoken. Um, it's that we can only have this conversation because we're running our own infrastructure. We're only getting into the nuance of Jetpack and WordPress.com versus WordPress.org because we own the infrastructure and we're trying to limit that data. If we were on Twitter, Facebook, Facebook Workplace, all of those other competitors and clones, we wouldn't even have the opportunity to have this conversation. Yeah, that's so important. And just the fact that we can iterate. And if we do something and the community says, you know, we're not comfortable with that, we don't like that, we want to go in a different direction that we can, we can change um, to be where the community is, which is really important. So I, I think one, one of the things that, and kind of just to, to tie that up a little bit too, like I know that there, and I have share the concerns about automatic too, like the, plenty of things to be concerned about there. But I do think that at this point, you know, WordPress is, is a bit, I do, I do think we can bank a little bit on the size of WordPress as a open source project, right? Like that doesn't mean that nothing could ever bad, bad could ever happen to the the tools of course but um that also doesn't mean that uh the community can't uh and has in with wordpress before in other ways in smaller ways um taken back and remove things like that 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 is the value of the, these open infrastructure as Ed, as you just said um so that does make me I have a lot more faith in that happening than a, um, you know, a, a project that is smaller and only receives contributions from a single company, you know, not, um, for instance. On another positive note, I mean, one of the things we've noticed at, at Reclaim is a lot of open lab CBOX projects, uh, community, uh, Kingsborough Community College, um, SBS. Uh, there's also the one Aaron Glass started at UCSD. Um, I think there was one in Connecticut that I'm forget. But like we have, you know, we've hosted many, but this year has seemed a bit of an explosion of people doing CBOX stuff and um, investing in that. And I think, I think maybe it's a sign of like what are the other alternatives that don't meet some of the guidelines we're talking about here and there's very few out there and it makes cbox a really a gem um for the community at large and uh so thank you everybody who joined this call who works on that project and i know what it's like to work in higher ed and jody i feel your pain you know in terms of just like you know post pandemic and what's going on but like you all have been doing the work for a long, long time. So uh, kudos, 
definitely to the groups that have done this. And from our side at Reclaim, you know, we're seeing people who are investing in it and, and, you know, keep going with it. So that's cool. It's very cool to see. I should just claim, I don't think, I'm not saying that nobody is engaged. I just feel like the student body in general, yeah. I'm, I'm not a, that I don't tend toward that, but I, I'm seeing differences just in terms of how they're engaging with online spaces. Almost higher ed. I mean, I don't want to be too broad, but I don't think it's probably limited to CUNY, right? No. I think there's just a kind yeah. of, I don't know, weirdness with this return. Yeah. But we're seeing, I mean, incredible projects that are coming about. Um, I just, so I'm happy to, I'm happy to see that there's an ongoing use. Um, I, I, I hope that students can begin to feel more comfortable seeing it as a space that where they can um, communicate freely. I don't think, like, and I don't think that it's the privacy stuff that you, um, that I think you're suggesting. I think it's more just like a, I'm just gonna sit here and say nothing <laughs> vibe that um, I, I am experiencing um, in the classroom. And I think other folks, you know, plenty of other people are experiencing as well. I think it's like an apprehension to engage. There's sort of a fear that comes that's happening, and I and what we experienced. Jody and I ran the Open Lab at City Tech um, interns this semester, along with another colleague, Jonas. And I think they just needed like an entry in, and so some in some ways that may just be some programming or some way that um, it may not be digital, <laughs> but maybe some kind of programming that can engage the students to say like, "This is your space." Um, and certainly, uh, you know, there is no other place where an individual, a student or a student group or a faculty member or faculty member can just create a site without right. getting some, uh, having to go through the administration. So it, it allows that, um, that flexibility. And I think, again, I think it's just sort of a, an invitation to, to participate and um, rather than just putting it there and, and waiting for people to come. And I think there's a lot to be built on on Jean's earlier comment about the virtual campus, right? This is the virtual campus community. And I think understanding that and thinking about what other people are trying to do to create that, you know, sense and how CBOX really does that, um, it's probably a good guide for moving forward, you know, and understanding more of it is gonna go remote. And how do we create this sense of ownership and interaction online? I mean, it's kind of a lot of the work that's been going on for years just to figure that out. So it's cool that you have a real tool that people can install in a click to make that happen for a whole community. Well, we're a couple minutes over time, so I think we'll probably wrap it up here, but um, I th thanks everyone who was able to attend here and, um, and I hope folks who are watching later to appreciate it. This is, um, this is a great conversation. I'm, I'm really excited we had everybody uh everybody who's here um able to contribute so thank you so much yeah thanks everybody thank you